All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys. Episode 6,000 of the show, finally. Gareth Porter the Great, author of Manufacture Crisis and the Perils of Dominance and an upcoming book about the old Cold War before the new Cold War that we're all waiting with bated breath for. That all rhymed, you got to admit it. Welcome back, Gareth. How you doing, sir? I'm fine. Thanks, Scott. And I'm glad to be uh, on your 6,000th show. I'm very <laughs> honored, to say the least. Well, you know what? Everybody go back and check number 5,000. We did the life and times of Gareth Porter, which was really great. You guys know I always just go by the article, but this time we did an interview of the man about the man. And it was a lot of fun. I just did something a bit like that with uh, Glenn Greenwald. Not so much about his life, but about uh, his point of view on politics and things. Um, a bit more, because but we were catching up after a long time. But anyway, uh, and it was great, that uh, episode uh, 5000 of The Life and Times of Gareth Porter. I want to go back and listen to that now that I mention it. But anyway, <laughs> I'm so happy to have you on. And um, I want to talk to you about lots of things. I guess, first of all, I should tell you, people really care about you. And I get emails and I get DMs on the Twitter there and things. And people say, where is Gareth Porter? Is he safe? Is he all right? And I always tell them, no, he's just fine. He's writing a book about the old Cold War. And it's tough being an author, man. Trust me, it sucks, everybody. I, I'm vouching for my man here. He's, I've got too many jobs to get mine done. He's got few enough that I think he's actually making progress on his. Can you tell us about the book? Does it have a title? And can you give away everything except everything in it? Sure. For for you and your listeners, I'll be glad to do that. Um, it's, it's going to be called The Cold War as a Deception. And it is a, a new, uh, very much revisionist, and even beyond revisionism, uh, history of the Cold War, specifically of U.S. policy in the Cold War. And it, it's uh, going to document the fact that, the reality that the U.S. government um, systematically uh, lied to the American public and key national security officials lied to the president of the United States to deceive the president of the United States on numerous occasions during uh, the period of the Cold War from 1950 to 19, well, the end of the Cold War, 1990 or 1991. Um, and then I choose that part of the Cold War. It's actually all except for the early Cold War from 1946 to 49. Um, but but I choose to focus on that because uh, what I discovered in my in my research is that the uh, it was the 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 uh, push for rearmament by the U.S. military and its political allies that generated the first round of deceptions of the president of the United States and. Uh, you know, in turn of the U.S. public, and that that really set the stage for this pattern of uh, of systematic deceptions that characterized U.S. major U.S. Uh, policy decisions from that time on until the end of the Cold War. So that, in a nutshell, is really the thesis uh, that I am <laughs> developing in the book. Mm -hmm. But so is and, that another way of saying kind of, geez, it wasn't Harry Truman and Ike Eisenhower's fault that they went along with this? They didn't really know? 
Well, uh, I mean, because, you know, they say about W. Truman, Bush, they go, well, it was I, bad I intelligence, to, have, you know. Yeah, yeah. I have to distinguish between or among various presidents. OK. <laughs> and not only that, I also distinguish between those instances in which some presidents were victims of uh, deception and other instances in which the same president was guilty of carrying out a deception of the American public. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more complicated pattern sure. that you see. Hey, uh, you know, but it all traces back to this um, requirement to uh, deceive the American public uh, or the president or both in order for the national security state to achieve its own goals or its own interests. Well, look, in essence, we're not talking about Stalin's attitude. We're talking about his military capability and what our government pretended to believe it was, essentially. Is well, that correct? That's that's where it started. That's right. Exactly. Uh, and that was the key to pushing through uh, the, well, it, it was the first effort. Let me put it this way. It was the first effort to push through uh, a, uh, a rearmament program. And, and it was uh, the, the Secretary of State uh, of the time um, who was uh, Truman's closest uh, ally, um, or closest advisor, who was the, the key to that aspect, that element of the deception. But very quickly then, uh, it was the it was the entrance of the United States into the Korean War, which provided the uh, opportunity or the necessity, if you will, for the uh, key national security officials to pull a massive deception on Truman to, first of all, to get him to enter the war, uh, and secondly, to get him to agree uh, to for a massive rearmament program in in the very first uh, six months of the Korean War uh, on the grounds supposedly that uh, the the Chinese counteroffensive against uh, U.S. troops who had carried out this uh, stupid effort by MacArthur uh, to uh, come up right up to the Yalu River the the uh, Chinese uh, border. Uh, they they counterattacked and and basically it was a huge defeat for MacArthur, and and Truman was so convinced that that uh, convinced by, by Atchison and uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff that this was the beginning of a Soviet worldwide uh, uh, military offensive that he agreed to their demand for this complete rearmament program. And that's hmm. how it all started, really. Wow. So, well, I want to keep asking you questions, but I'll wait. The other thing yeah, on my mind the is... The book, by the way, is all finished ahead. except for a conclusion. And and it, that would be done uh, by now, except for the fact that the Israelis began this horrible... Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Mass atrocity. Yeah. My book has also been put on a terrible yeah. delay here because of current events, of course, as well. But, um, right. yeah, the other thing is I keep thinking if I could ever get my book finished and then edited way, way down to a reasonable length, I sure would be interested in what you thought of it. I couldn't ask you to read it now, Gareth. You know, you'd never forget. Well, me. if it's still, if it's still going on when I'm finished with my book, which won't be very long in the future, and if and if this war somehow can be ended, then I'll promise to read it. All right. Well, it's almost twelve hundred pages now, and I know I got to cut it in half. I'm yeah, gonna. Good I don't know what the hell I'm gonna <laughs> do. But and then, like you say, I got the same problem here with current events taking up all my attention. It's very difficult to get back to writing a history book about how much I hate Bill Clinton. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's absolutely got to be in there. I'm sure you knew this, but. I just, I can't help, but I hope I'm not giving away or whatever. I just think this is bananas. Maybe a lot of people know this or I don't know who does, but to me, it blows me away that before the ATF even raided the Branch Davidians, just like two weeks into Bill Clinton's presidency, he'd already ruined a peace deal in Bosnia. And not only that, 
this really pisses me off, Gareth, is, and must have pissed them off too, is it was Cyrus Vance's peace deal. And Cyrus Vance mm -hmm. had been, of course, Brzezinski's rival, the Secretary of State in the Carter administration. But the mm -hmm. incoming Secretary of State was Warren Christopher. And Warren right. Christopher had been Vance's deputy during Carter and like his protege, you know what I mean? Not just his, a guy that worked under him, but like he was his guy, right? Mm. So then Vance mm. cuts this deal and then Warren Christopher comes in and helps Bill Clinton destroy it. And this is just the beginning of 93. There's two and a half more years of killing left to go in Bosnia. By then the worst of it hadn't even begun yet. And so this is not just he ruined a peace deal, but this would be like if you struck a peace deal and then I ruined it. You know what I mean? Right, right, like these right. guys no, are this, such this, monsters. I just hate them so goddamn much. This it's is a huge story. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it it stands up uh, after all these years as as a major as a major event worth worth taking um, taking seriously. Yeah, all these guys, and that's like it's like Korea. It's one of the obscure ones, the Forgotten War. America messing yeah. around in Bosnia, messing around Korea. There's a great Ramondo article, by the way about how America started that war. I'm sure you already know everything about it, but uh, people can find that at antiwar.com. And it was about how the South had been attacking targets across the border with American help for a long time, deliberately provoking the North Korean attack, you know, the other way. Um, who would have well, thought, the South you know, like... The South definitely did want, the, the military wanted to go to war, no doubt about that. And so did Syngman Rhee. Uh, yeah, no, no yeah. question about that. Uh, it was uh, it was by no means a uh, a matter of an attack on an innocent bunch of uh, uh, of officials in South uh, South Korea. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. We should talk about the current events that's got us all diverted from our Cold War books that we're writing. Right. Um. So. Well, you got a couple of different articles here. I want to figure out which one I want to talk about first. I guess let's talk about the war propaganda. I'll tell you this much. I already talked to Max Blumenthal today about the war propaganda, how embellished it was, and also about some of the real truth of the friendly fire. And he's very careful. I mean, the guy's got a chip on his shoulder, clearly, but he doesn't embellish as far as how much friendly fire or anything like that, as some critic might want to presume or anything like that. He's, he does a very good job. So for that sake, let's just say we got that part of it on the record for today's yeah. show already. So Gareth, talk about what you really mentioned here in the headline is how Israel leverages right. genocide with Hamas massacres. What are you talking about here? Right. I mean, this is, uh, I think, one of the more important stories, uh, one of the most important story of recent uh, months with regard to the Israel-Palestine uh, issue, uh, which is that although, you know, I don't argue, <laughs> obviously, that, uh, that Netanyahu and his uh, advisors uh, somehow, you know, uh, faked a, uh, an attack uh, by Hamas. I mean, clearly Hamas did take the initiative on October 7th. There's no question about that. But but what I think is equally clear is that Netanyahu immediately saw this as an opportunity to uh, basically ensure that, uh, that they would be able to carry out the kind of attack that we have seen, the the genocidal offensive against uh, the, the population of Gaza that we have seen over the last three months, uh, and that, that he could get the United States to support it. And he would do that by portraying this uh, as a kind of genocidal, uh, you know, intended genocidal attack by, uh, by Hamas against innocent civilians in uh, in in the uh, kibbutzes uh, near the the border with with Gaza, um, and uh, he he had three days really between October seventh and the first uh, public statement that he made to come up with his strategy for how to do this. 
Um, and, and I think the strategy clearly envisioned that he would be able to um, persuade Biden through uh, Blinken, having traveled immediately, you know, running straight to Netanyahu to get the, the, his point of view about what happened, and, and then getting Blinken to take that point of view back to Biden, uh, he would ensure that they would uh, would go along with this uh, offensive, which, uh, you know, in in any normal uh, under any normal consideration by a U.S. administration, would be viewed with alarm and uh, with with great uh, determination to say, wait a minute, you know, this is uh, this is something that you can't go ahead and do without carefully working out uh you know what the costs and you know uh, consequences are both to the pop the civilian population and to the region um and that that of course was the opposite of what netanyahu did he he basically uh pulled this uh th this very clever political trick on uh, the Biden administration, uh, basically using Blinken, who, as everyone, I think uh, all of your listeners know, is a, a very longtime uh, Zionist, a, a, a very deep, deeply convinced uh, supporter of, of Israeli Zionism, and was was going to come back with whatever uh, you know Netanyahu told him. And uh, and and get Biden to go along with it. So that that was the essence of uh, what I think Netanyahu had in mind from the very beginning. And and what he did, of course, was to uh, put out the theme uh, that uh, this was uh, the same. You know that Hamas was doing what uh, the uh, uh, the uh, people who the the U.S. military uh, fought against across the Middle East did by killing massive numbers of civilians and uh, were were simply uh, were, were mass killers. Um, so so this was a very clever strategy. Uh, he he basically had his military spokesman ready when the the uh, the press first went to Kafar Azah, which was the first uh, kibbutz where the, the the press was allowed to come in and uh, talk to to be to be briefed by the military and even uh, possibly to talk to, to civilians who were there. And it was handled in such a way that uh, the military spokesman uh, essentially put out this story about. Uh, horrible atrocities against civilians beheaded babies uh being the the lead uh the lead story that was being put out um and uh you know burned uh, people being burned alive deliberately uh by by Hamas um and bodies desecrated uh parents being executed in front of their children and children being executed in front of their parents this was the story that was given out, and it and it created this bow wave of of stories uh, in the media. CNN led the crowd; they were the most enthusiastic and the first to put out a story based on the briefing they were getting uh, in Kafar Aza. Um, but it was it was so uh, horribly bad, so so obviously wrong that they had to correct the story about beheaded babies when they tried to get it uh, uh they tried to get someone in the military headquarters to uh confirm it and the military couldn't confirm it they couldn't offer any confirming evidence so uh CNN had to back down on that but nevertheless the story was out by uh October 10th uh that that all of these horrible atrocities had taken place and that really set this, the the tone for the the entire corpus of of mainstream media coverage 
of uh, the post October seventh conflict. Yeah, and then we do see, you know, Hamas is ISIS, and for people who, you know, that's the slogan. There's always a cutesy little focus group tested slogan with the Israelis, of course. Right. Um, right. And for people who are not too familiar, but ISIS is just Al Qaeda in Iraq from. George W. Bush's Iraq War II, and then worsened by Obama's filthy, disgusting, dirty war in Syria from 2011 through really the end of his presidency, which blew into the Islamic State Caliphate under Baghdadi, in, which took over all of Western Iraq in 2014 in what was and insane, as uh, Blumenthal put it, comparing here, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre style, just ultra violence. That is what happened in Western Iraq in 2014 when ISIS came. Patrick Coburn, right. who is the most important Western reporter in the Middle East, uh, said then, these guys are like the Islamist Khmer Rouge. Right. They are bananas. They come into a town and they did butcher people. They did throw alleged homosexuals off rooftops and, uh, you know, machine gun innocent people as well as prisoners of war and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, nightmarish, you know, biblical level. Um, and that they were caught up even in that stuff. Right. This is all right. the Bible and, and, coming and true. Nope. We're fighting the new Rome and all this. But that's not Hamas. But what Netanyahu's doing is saying, remember how bad ISIS was in Western Iraq a few years ago? Well, that's what we're dealing with here. And remember how you dealt with Mosul and and uh, Ramadi and Raqqa? Well, that's what we're doing here. And yep. so, uh, and then, can you talk about this too? And this is, according to Biden which I don't know what you can believe because Biden's the same guy who claimed the that he saw the pictures of the beheaded babies, which is an outright lie. But well, he, he had also to take said it back. that Netanyahu he had, he had to told take, him... He had to take that statement Wait, wait, wait back. One, sec, one second, and then I'll shut up, I swear. But he also told... He also said that Netanyahu told him, this is just like when you guys firebombed Germany and Japan and even used right. the nukes in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you guys can firebomb Dresden and Hamburg and Tokyo and nuke Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then I can do what I'm doing in Gaza based, again, on this Hamas is ISIS level ultra violence here. Right. It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant uh, strategy for assuring, uh, you know, that, that there would be no, no questioning, no serious questioning of, of what, what Netanyahu was about and what the IDF was about in Gaza. Uh, and and his his uh, uh, slogan was that uh, Hamas is ISIS, and that that was you know <laughs> the the shortest and pithiest way he could possibly have stated it, and uh, got the message across to Americans and particularly to the administration. Yeah, well, and so there's a quote I saw just a couple of days ago. I'm sorry I didn't have time to Google it up uh, real quick, but there was an Israeli brigadier general who said. Every plane we're flying, every bomb we're dropping, everything we're doing is with the United States backing us up and, and with <laughs> their equipment on every level. And without them, we could not do what we're doing now. And I think he was just being grateful. But that really is right. true, yeah. isn't it? He didn't intend to, to, to start a new propaganda of, of offensive, I don't think, because that probably would not have been a good idea. Yeah. Well, what's the reality? Is that exactly true? Of course, it's true. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the Israelis could not carry out any serious offensive militarily in uh, in Gaza. Uh, I mean, in terms of bombing, without the United States uh, being fully supportive and agreeing essentially uh, to cover it in advance, uh, telling them, "Yeah, go ahead. You've got you've got a free hand." Uh, and then midway through it, uh, or, or not midway, but farther farther into it, again repeating. That um, you know we we uh, support what you're doing. Uh, we have certain questions about whether you're giving sufficient protection to uh, you know the civilian population, but we're we're behind you, and you can have uh, just about as many more bombs as you as you please. And that's what they did in November. In November, they replenished the bomb supply, mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically. 
uh, allowed the Israelis to to do whatever they wanted, despite the fact that uh, they were telling the American public that you know they're trying to assure the American public, yes, we are doing our best to uh, to make sure that the Israelis uh, give uh, sufficient attention to protection of the human of of the civilian population. I read the other day that it was 10,000 tons of bombs we've given them so far in this thing, just since October. Uh, I, I'm not sure that sounds it sounds reasonable. I haven't uh, specifically checked on what the latest the latest um, total would have been. But I think uh, it's not so much the total the total uh, tonnage dropped that is the the really shocking, uh, reality underlying this offensive it's the way in which they have used the 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 most horrible uh pop uh, anti-population bombs which uh which have uh, a a uh, radius of destruction that goes uh if i remember correctly uh 400 yards in each direction 400 yards in each direction i mean you know and and these are bombs that uh inflict uh extreme harm to anyone who is in the path of the bombs in all directions and so you know this means that you are going to have uh children losing heads arms legs daily that is what has been happening yeah hey y'all i got a new coffee sponsor Mundo's Artisan Coffee at MundosArtisanCoffee.com. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like my brain is all dried out. I need to pour a hot mug of rich, tasty coffee all over it to get it back working again, like 10W30 for the noggin. Though not necessary, it helps if the coffee tastes good. Well, Mundo's Artisan Coffee does taste good. They get the best beans from all around the world, and they don't burn them. Support the show and support your brain at MundosArtisanCoffee.com. Just click the link at the right margin at scotthorton.org. Hey guys, I had some wasps in my house, so I shot them to death with my trusty Bug Assault 3.0 model with the improved salt reservoir and bar safety. I don't have a deal with them, but the show does earn a kickback every time you get a Bug Assault or anything else you buy from Amazon.com by way of the link in the right-hand margin on the front page at scotthorton.org. So keep that in mind. And don't worry about the mess. Your wife will clean it up. Well, folks, sad to say, they lied us into war. All of them. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq War I, Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq War II, Libya, Syria, Yemen. All of them. But now you can get the ebook, All the War Lies, by me for free. Just sign up for the email list at the bottom of the page at scotthorton.org or go to scotthorton.org slash subscribe. Get all the war lies by me for free. And then you'll never have to believe them again. Uh, Listen, so uh, the article here is uh, people can find at the Times of Israel, 244 U.S. cargo planes, 20 ships deliver over 10,000 tons of military equipment to Israel. And they yeah. are citing Channel 12 in Israel for that report and, yeah. you know, military sources for that and now you know we got to talk about this it keeps coming up on this show but not too many other places but this is exactly what caused september 11th and i know that al-qaeda is sort of kind of a front for saudi and american intelligence at different times america backed the arab afghan brigades in the 80s bill clinton sure as hell backed them in bosnia kosovo and chechnya and um, we all know that in the aftermath of Iraq War II, Barack Obama backed them in Libya, Syria, and Yemen, although varying degrees of directly. I mean, he was certainly fighting wars to their benefit and knowing it, using them against really Israel's enemies, the Shiites, which America, I guess, mm -hmm. also hates. But I think Israel's the real reason America hates the Shiites as much as the Bin Ladenites, even though it wasn't Hezbollah that knocked the damn towers down, Gareth, as you might remember. Yeah. It was yeah. the other guys. But um, point being that if you read the biographies of the 9-11 hijackers, they were pissed off about 
Israel and about American support for yes. Israel. And if you yes. read right. bin Laden's 1996 declaration of war, he says, we'll never forget the severed arms and heads of the babies at Kana, referring to the first mm -hmm. Kana massacre because they did it again 10 years later. But the right. first Kana massacre of 1996, where the Israelis bombed the UN shelter. And you know what? I only found this out recently. Hat tip to Jonathan Schwartz. Did you know Naftali Bennett was the guy that did it? He was the guy that called in the strike on the UN shelter that killed 106 uh, Palestinian women and children hiding there, which is what I didn't. I didn't know that he was the man. No, I didn't know that. And then, which that was what, and you can find it in Israeli press. They talk all about it. It's totally yeah. true. And yeah. and um, they're very proud of it. I'm sure. I'm absolutely proud. Oh yeah, he doesn't care. And then, but this is what was the primary motivation for that Operation Grapes of Wrath, and then especially that Kana massacre, was the motivation for these German engineering students studying in Hamburg to want to join Al-Qaeda and fight against the United States. Mm -hmm. And including, successfully, these are the guys who killed 3,000 Americans. Right. And right. so, you know, I was kind of rambling to the judge earlier. I think I made him mad, but you forgive me. I love you, Gareth. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that bin Laden is dead. And I think that, I don't know if Zawahiri's dead or not, but even Zawahiri didn't really have the charisma and the chutzpah and the whatever you call it, I don't know, that that gave him sort of this unofficial command authority and loyalty of so many international jihadis from all around the world and all around the Middle East. With If he said, look, what we want to do is this, they really followed that uh, to such a great degree. And I don't know. I guess I really need to start paying attention to Bill Rogio again. I don't know of like who is really in charge of Al Qaeda now, how independent from Saudi intelligence they are at this point, uh, whether they are determined to attack the far enemy, the United States. But it's so easy to see how history could repeat itself here. And of course, with all the you know, the FBI had to frame up a lot of kooks, but after a while, we started having real ones. You know what I mean? And um, you yeah. could have a lone wolf with just a, a gun who hijacks a fuel truck or a guy who gets a hold of, uh, you know, a pretty good rifle and a nice soft target and does some terrible thing. Like, I feel like we're just on the verge of this. And I know whatever false flag this and that to me is regardless. You know what I mean? You could have some kook kill a bunch of innocent people. And then what's here in America in a terrorist attack? And then what's Joe Biden going to do then? They're going to blame it on freedom and radical Islam. They're going to blame it on the Shiites this time. Or I don't know what, who's even in charge to decide Jake Sullivan Tell me something, yeah, really. Gareth. It seems like a real problem going forward here, man, after because this is what this is the Kana massacre every day for three months. This is like the Waco massacre every day, sometimes three yeah. or four or five Waco massacres a day, every day for months yes. and months and months is what's happening yeah. to these people right now. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I I can't say that I, you know would rule out what you're suggesting as a possibility. I certainly it is. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we should not lose sight of of the present reality that is has been created by this atrocity that we're uh, talking or we're just discussing now uh, of the Israeli um, attack on on Gaza, uh, which which is really seriously to be considered in terms of of uh, genocide and uh you know that is something that has clearly not just upset people around the middle east but has forced or 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 has has induced governments in the middle east to take action that um uh, you know is is uh Serious pos is posing the serious threat of uh, of an enlargement of the war, and and this is a direct cost, uh, risk and cost of the policy that the United States has chosen to pursue in in response to this atrocity by Israel. Yeah. So, and this does get right to the irony of the thing. I don't know if I can ever really state it right, but again, the point being that. 
the American government and the Israeli government's enemy in the region is Iran and all their friends, which thanks to America includes Baghdad now and Damascus more than ever before and Sana'a down in Yemen more than ever before under yep. the control of the Houthis. And yep. so our government and Israel's government are in agreement that that's their enemy, as I mentioned there, even to the degree that during Obama years, they're willing to outright back the bin Ladenites in their uh, horrible war in Syria and to such a terrible degree that it ended up blowing up into the damn caliphate of 14 mm -hmm. through 17 there. It's just incredible. Um, it's almost unbelievable, except I remember it. Uh, but anyway, so they have us now, Gareth, as you're talking about, at risk of expanding the war. What you mean is expanding the war to the rest of the Shiite alliance, to Hezbollah, to Syria, to Iraq, to, yeah. to Yemen, and maybe even to Iran itself, which is, you know, I don't know exactly what is the Iraqi government's role other than <laughs> they don't really know what to do. But these militias that grew up to fight ISIS, Obama's fault, right. they are the PMU militias. They are attacking American forces in Iraq, and that could lead to Iraq War Four right there. And yep. I don't know how... How concerned are you about how out of control this is going to get? And for that matter, as long as I'm asking you that, what about the possibility that the government in Egypt or Jordan, et cetera, could fall, that you would have, or even Saudi, that you would have Sunni states actually acting under the will of their populations and siding with the Shiites against the Americans and the Israelis? Well, I, I, you know, I'm no expert on the various uh, political situations around the Middle East, believe me. Uh, but but I do think that uh, there there is a the greatest risk at this point is the enlargement of the war into Lebanon. And that's for good historical, I mean, sound historical reasons in the sense that uh, both Hezbollah on the Lebanese side of the border and Israel have uh, been eyeing each other for years and years, have unfinished business with each other. Um, and the Israelis in particular have been weighing, can we get away with attacking across the border? What would be the cost to us? And, um, you know, I, I think that there is a not tiny and not inconsiderable chance that the Israelis would, in fact, uh, choose to enlarge the war into Lebanon. I think that would be um, the most likely scenario for uh, one of the most serious consequences that could could occur because of, of this uh, atrocity of, of Israeli uh, uh, attack on, on Gaza. Um, and, and that um, I mean, you know, Lebanon really has only uh, Hezbollah to protect it. Um, and Hezbollah does not want to have a war. It's clear that's that's their their policy at this point. But at the same time, um, if the Israelis uh, were to take steps that they could easily, uh, I, I can easily imagine they could take, uh, because they feel that it would be in their interest, then then we would have a, uh, another major war in the Middle East uh, yeah. with terrible consequences. And, I, and I'm very worried about that. Well, I don't know if you saw this clip, but somebody asked Joe Biden, are the strikes against the Houthis working? And he says, what, working in the sense of accomplishing something? No. Are they going to no, continue? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I yeah, think yeah. I think that was what he said, accomplishing something. I may have misparaphrased, but it's very no, close. Was, anyway. That was very close to the yeah, exact yeah. word. So, um, yeah. and that's the thing is we already know that the Houthis and their poor population can take a beating, and that regime is not going anywhere. Saudi right. and UAE and Al-Qaeda, backed by the United States, just failed to dislodge them from power after a war that lasted for, was it, eight or nine years? Um, yeah, with, with heavy bombing by the Saudis uh, and the UAE. An unbelievable uh, campaign against them, air campaign especially against them. Um, and so, 
and the Americans, they're not putting troops up in Sada province or whatever. They'd be insane. The chiefs have got to be telling Biden that that's not a choice. I mean, I'm just making oh, that up. I guarantee up, but you they God's are. Sake. Yeah, they're not, they're not going to do that. They're not going to willingly. <laughs> but look, what about them having a problem with the scary government in Baghdad? I mean, how close are they to Iran compared to America? This guy, al-Sudani, is from Skiri, right? The current prime yeah. minister? I think that's right. Um, you know, I'm not following. I'm not following um, Iraqi uh, politics closely, not for sure. Uh, I'm furious. I'm way I'm behind sure on it myself. I admit, but I'm interested. I need to get back into it, man, because. You know, I think Iran has always had more influence over the Supreme Islamic Council guys than America, and certainly at this point. And they yes. tried to kick us out. You know, I don't know if the parliament voted, but the president said, or the, the, the prime minister said, beat it. And the Americans said, well, we got all your gold, so we can just yeah. destroy your currency and just yeah. blackmail them. But at some point, you know, perils of dominance, just because we can hurt them doesn't mean they're not willing to take it in order to— declare independence at the point that they feel like they absolutely have to, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, uh, in fact, that you've invoked uh, the title of my earlier book on Vietnam, Perils of Dominance, because it is so relevant to the present situation. And I summed it up that, right. Isn't that the point that just because you're so big and tough doesn't really mean that everybody's going to do what you say. And right, so be right. careful how deeply you commit yourself to applying coercion to these threats you shouldn't have made. Right. Yeah. And, and furthermore, I mean, to, just to extend that a, a bit further to, to where I think it really cuts uh, more, uh, even more dramatically, uh, you know, the United States does, in fact, have the military capability, which is many times greater than any other player uh, in the region, um, and it could use it. And it's always going to be tempting for a president to imagine that he could use it. But the fact is, as you've said, that we are simply exposing ourselves, our own interests and the interests of the region of the populations of the region and of of world peace uh, to the threat of a a war which is not going to be in anybody's interest and is inevitably going to uh, harm the uh, interests of the American people. Yeah. Well, now, so far, it looks like the Ayatollah doesn't want to fight, and Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, doesn't want to fight. Right. But right. Uh, again, at some point, they've got their line where they're willing to. And, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And and you know, I mean, this this issue that we've just been talking about between Israel and um, Hezbollah and and um, Lebanon, the larger Lebanon. Uh, is is made much more uh, dangerous because the Israelis are making territorial claims on the other side of the present truce line. Uh, Shaba Farms um, is a is a place where the Israelis are saying, "Well, that we really think that's our that that belongs to us." That's on the Golan and, Heights, right? That's really Syrian territory that they have occupied since sixty seven. Right, right, and and so this is um, this is the most dangerous element in the situation that the Israelis have that in the back of their minds, or not even in the back of their minds, in the forefront of their minds, and um, and and that is uh, easily could become uh, part of or the primary thrust of uh, a a uh, set of interactions that would result in that war that I've just been talking about. Yeah, man. Um, you know, I have a friend of mine who's an old army guy who said to me, so worried about the draft, he wants to start organizing against it. And I'm telling him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. That Our army does not want a conscript army. And our population of 18-year-olds is not really fit to be conscripted anyway. And they would rather rely on high tech and quote unquote volunteers. They're very well paid. But anyway... Um, you know, yeah, a non-slave army is what now. they mean by that, at least. So, but then I'm thinking, you know, this Biden kook has 
Ghana is really threatening war in Europe and in Asia. I just talked with Tim Shorrock today about brinksmanship with the North Koreans, leading us toward, boy, talk about a black pit there, a possible atomic war with those guys, uh, picking a fight with Iran and the whole regional Shiite alliance there that Bush and Obama built and all of this. Um, I I don't know if they're really committed. Well, I, I think you're they right get into, he's playing. Go ahead. He, he's playing with fire, but but I think that the the point that we need to keep focusing on, it, I, he really doesn't want to have a war. I mean, there's no question in my mind that that he wants to avoid it, particularly in the run up to a general election. I mean, that would not be the best move for him to make uh, politically, to say the least. But um, you know, the problem is that he is. As we've been discussing earlier, he's wedded himself to the interests of Israel uh, in a way that makes it much more difficult, if not impossible, for him to uh, really prevent the the kinds of behavior that is so dangerous in this situation by, yeah. by the Israelis. Right. I mean, it's become this ridiculous ritual where Blinken goes and says, geez, we'd wish you guys would tone it down just a little bit. He just does that <laughs> over and over again, and it means nothing. Although, in fact, I should ask you about this. The Wall Street Journal claims that while they are backing down and they pulled a lot of troops out, I think they said hundreds. Yeah, here, Israel, under pressure to scale back intensity of war, pulls thousands of troops from Gaza, which, of course— that could just mean a higher intensity air campaign coming up, or I don't know exactly what. At the same time, they're saying this is going to last through the rest of the year. Uh, somewhat, they're saying, and this is, if you want, we can change the subject to South Africa here. In fact, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. They're talking about, they deny it sometimes. Uh, Netanyahu himself, I should say, the prime minister, denies it sometimes. But he also has said he's looking for the rest of the world to, quote, absorb the population of the Gaza Strip uh, and means to get rid of them. And in practice, it sure looks like they're trying to push everybody south and eventually, as they have talked about, into the Sinai Peninsula or elsewhere in Egypt and on from there. Unbelievably, as long as I'm citing things, the Times of Israel reported that they were in talks with Congo to send the poor Palestinians right. to go and, uh, right. I guess... Toil well, in Israeli-owned cobalt mines as slaves until they're dead? Is it, Are they kidding me with this shit? I mean, how far? But then, okay, here's the other thing. is I'm, I got that off my chest, but let me set you up here. And I mean this quite sincerely. The G word is a big one. And the Americans throw it around all the time when they're trying to start a war. Like, they'll go, yep. oh, Sebrenica, that was a genocide, so now we get to bomb you. This kind of right. thing. Well, Sebrenica right. was pretty bad, but doesn't seem like much of a genocide. And I'm not sure is, look, obviously ethnic cleansing is a horrible euphemism, but is it a horrible euphemism for genocide? Because, you know, as my friend Daryl Cooper was saying on the Twitter the other day, look, man, if everything is genocide, then we need a new word for what happened to the Armenians. Okay. And he wasn't talking about the recent cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh. He was talking about the bad one at the hands of the Turks before, after World War One, Right. And um, so um, now I know that obviously the ultimate example is the Holocaust and then Israeli public relations would say that nothing short of a full Holocaust already accomplished counts, uh, which serves their interest. On the other hand, people tossing around keywords in order to get what they want is supposed to not be very impressive either. And so... Clearly what's happening to the Palestinians is absolutely horrible, but I wonder, oh, and I meant to say, sorry, the Rome statute, I think is so particular, you could even have a situation where people are forced marched, like say Nagorno-Karabakh last September, October, where the Azerbaijanis forced marched them out and evidently no one was killed or single digits or something were killed, but they completely kicked the Armenians out of there. I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh is no longer Artsakh. I mean, it is over. So does that count as genocide? And then at that point, now we're just throwing around the G word everywhere. I don't know. On the other hand, 
I wa- I read much of and I watched the three hour presentation of the South Africans case to the International Court of Justice, which is not prose- not asking for prosecutions of war criminals and accusing that, but they're asking essentially for an injunction, some kind of measures to get the, the Court of Justice to ask Israel politely to stop, I guess, because there is no real world government to enforce it except America and America's on Israel's side. But anyway, um, they presented one hell of a case there and including a lot of statements by Israeli officials citing the Old Testament and worse, talking about how guilty every last Gazan is and why it's okay to kill them all or remove them all. So that's a handful of topics I brought up for you to grapple with there. But I know that you uh, read the thing very carefully and wrote about it. So can you first of all start with the use of the word genocide and how appropriate it is or isn't in whichever circumstances in your point of view and how you think it applies here? Well, first of all, I think you're undoubtedly right that it has been overused in the past. Um, it, it has been sort of a political, uh, uh, you know, a, a political weapon, if you will, uh, in various circumstances by the United States. But on the other hand, uh, there are uh, there, there is a lot of evidence to really believe that the Israelis have intended to eliminate the population of uh, the, the the Palestinian population of Gaza, um, and that that the they intended to do it in such a way as to physically uh, remove not not remove to physically um kill or or severely injure a very large percentage of the population um or or to make them believe that they faced uh such a horrible fate and that this uh that, that, that these po- policy intentions reflected a broad uh, view within the Israeli civilian population, representing essentially the right wing uh, politically in the country, um, and and to try to estimate precisely, uh, you know, what percentage of the population that includes would be difficult, but it's somewhere between thirty percent and forty five percent. It's it's not small. It's a very it's a very significant percentage of the population of Israel, who who truly believe that the Palestinian population needs to be uh, ended, removed, um, killed, um, slaughtered. I mean, they they do have a a genocidal attitude, and and it is expressed. Um, uh, in many many places, it's it's universal within that segment of the population. They make no bones about it, um, and and that to me weighs heavily in the uh, consideration of this question of of whether Israel intends uh, to carry out genocide. Um, that that does not certainly does not mean that every Israeli believes in that, or necessarily that a majority of Israelis believes in that. But that does happen to be the viewpoint of the most powerful uh, segment of the Israeli, the present Israeli government. Yeah. And so you know, I would think that any uh, judge who was trying to make a decision about the intent of the Israeli government would have to take that set of of facts into account very seriously, um, and and so that that's really the essence of my take on this question of of whether the Israeli government intends to carry out um, a genocide against the, the Palestinians. They're doing a very good job of it. Um, in in a very short time, in a very few months, the uh, Israelis have already killed between one and two percent of the uh, Palestinian population. It may be higher than that because it's uh, there's so many bodies under the rubble 
that have not been identified and are not known. And, and so the, the accurate count of the deaths is really yet to be made. Yeah. Hey, you guys, did you know that I don't just write books? I publish them. Well, the Institute does, and I'm the director, so yeah. Thirteen of them now, including my four. We published five more in 2023. Lori Calhoun and Tom Wood's books about the COVID regime, Joe Solis Mullen on the fake China threat, Jim Bovard's latest, Last Rights, and our managing editor, Keith Knight's, Domestic Imperialism. And we've got more great titles coming in 2024. Check them out at libertarianinstitute.org slash books and help support our anti-government efforts at libertarianinstitute.org slash donate. And thank you. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Let me tell you about Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Who knew? Artificial bank credit expansion leads to price inflation and terribly distorted markets. If you've got any savings left at all, you need to protect them. You need to put some, at least, into precious metals. Well, Roberts and Roberts can set you up with the best deals on silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. And they've been doing this since 1977. Hey, if you just need some sound advice about sound money, they're there for you too. Call Tim Fry and the guys at 800-874-9760. That's 800-874-9760. Or check them out at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. You'll be glad you did. I mean, this is the thing, and I can understand so well how just, if you're just ignorant and you just know America's friends with the Israelis, then you just assume that they're fighting more or less within American rules of war, which are, you know, I don't know, debatable, but I don't know. But then, like, I don't know, no. What if England and France went to war and the English just started absolutely mass murdering the French population. And we have to admit at some point, hey, we like the British and everything, but what the hell? They're way out of line here, right? What is going yeah. on? So is, I forget the social psychology of whose side you're on and everything. Like, is it possible that you could really, really like Israel and also go, holy crap, this is... Not, and I know this from talking with veterans, including on this show, this is not how America fought Iraq War II or even Iraq War III. And you compare it to the war against um, the Islamic State in Mosul. That'd be a comparable comparison to bring up. And in fact, these rules of engagement are far worse than what America right. did there. Oh, and that's infinitely. according to the Wall Street yeah. Journal and a hell of a lot of Iraq veterans, et cetera. Now, let me make one more point that I neglected uh, to make, which is really vitally important. And, and that is that um, the, the uh, number of people, or the percentage of the population that have been killed by bombing is undoubtedly going to be smaller uh, and, and perhaps very much smaller than the percentage of the population that is uh, that dies because of the enforced starvation and disease that the Israeli government is now imposing on that population intentionally. I mean, they, they know exactly what they're doing. They Can you are, talk a little bit more about the details of, of the humanitarian crisis there? I mean, I know people yes. are going hungry, but can you elaborate, please? Yeah. I mean, basically, uh, uh, the the uh, degree of starvation at this point is that um, most people in um, the, popu the, the population of Gaza uh, already are at the point of starvation, at the beginning point of starvation. And as much as uh, a quarter of that total population are already in the most serious stage of uh, of that uh, problem of of starvation and so i mean that is the beginning point and and you know the israelis are deliberately manipulating uh preventing more than a trickle of aid uh food and medicine and water to go into gaza um knowingly because they intend to use that uh to to force the population uh, either to leave the country or to give up and the 
the the government, the, 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 not the government, but to force Hamas uh, to to somehow uh, surrender. Uh, so so this is a is both a genocidal policy and a weapon of war. <clears throat> uh, it, it's uh, it has this rather indistinct status somewhere in between the two things. Yeah, uh, you know, well, it's facing both ways. Now, you know, that that starvation is part of it. And, and of course, because of the lack of food, because of the lack of sanitation, because of the lack of of any place to to uh, sleep for for, you know, huge percentage of the population uh, in, in Gaza, the the degree of disease is spreading every day. U.N. Uh, agencies are alarmed about this and they expect that in in very uh, this has already started that that a an epidemic uh will begin or has already begun uh in in gaza which will uh which they believe is going to cause far more deaths than uh than have been caused by the bombing a, a multiple of the deaths caused by the bombing God. yeah because it is you know you mentioned before the people buried alive or buried dead, but I think that should be mentioned every time. You know, none of these people live in a little single family home where if it blows up, whatever, at least you know they're dead. Here, the Israelis in a lot of cases are hitting five and seven story concrete buildings right. with a small bomb at the bottom, enough to make the thing collapse. But then you got who knows how many people just trapped in there in the void spaces. But then nobody's coming. There's no fire engine with a ladder. And there's no, you know, heavy machinery, uh, you know, giant claws from some big yellow truck that can pick up these giant slabs of concrete. Nothing. So these they people are just nothing. buried alive in there. And you can yeah. see if you look, just type in buried alive in your search in Twitter. I don't know about TikTok and the rest of them, Instagram and whatever. But uh, on Twitter, you will see people's hands sticking out women's hands sticking out and they're screaming in Arabic for the yes, love of God, yes. somebody get me the hell out of here. And you know that nobody's coming. They're dying in there, which means, you know, they, they survived more or less intact, the original strike. And now they're going to die over seven days of dehydration and hunger yeah. in the, yeah. in the dark alone, in the worst fate, worse than death that you could possibly do to somebody. But and again, they're doing I that to people by the Scott. thousands and thousands and thousands, burying them alive, right, right. like I in mean, the tales from the crypt. It's it's horrible. But again, I want to emphasize that it, it is clear at this point that the the threat of not just the threat, but the reality of starvation and disease is, is going to be far worse in terms of the numbers of of Palestinians oh yeah because that's what I was gonna say was yeah now come the rats and the yeah. rats are gonna come yeah. and eat those corpses when the Israelis yeah, don't bulldoze already, yeah. the whole place first and that's what's gonna spread the disease that's what you're uh implying there right and, and this is a deliberate strategy by by Israel I mean it's discussed I mean I, I I'm going to publish an article I was working on it uh, yesterday but I've had to travel so I haven't finished it I'm, I'm going to publish an article uh, about a general, an IDF general, retired, who published a piece uh, two months ago. Um, I'm sorry, not not two months ago, uh, a month and a half ago, who who talks about a strategy of using starvation uh, as a weapon of war, um, and um, you know, that's exactly what they're practicing. It's completely bananas. And one well, that's its own phenomenon in this war is official statements from the Netanyahu regime. But then you can see the clear parallel to Rumsfeld's generals, where they have all these retired officials who are very clearly close to the defense establishment and close to the Likud party, who then say some of the more wilder trial balloon type things out there in the press. But they are clearly speaking for the defense establishment or at least the Likud party there, huh? Seems like. You know, I think that that this was undoubtedly somebody who has not just Likud party contacts, but who is 
very close to the head of uh, the heads of IDF, the uh, Israeli Defense Force. Yeah, which is uh, I think even more important because the IDF is has a great deal of power now to you know take um, uh, take the initiative and to convince the government this is what we need to do. Yeah. Now, did you get that thing I sent you? Did you already know about this this interview with Arnon Soffer? from the Jerusalem Post yes, from 2004. I, I've, I've seen that before, but I hadn't seen it for years. Yeah. So I'll just sum this up for people real quick because it seems real relevant to our discussion. I'll try to get a good segue here. This is 2004, a year before the so-called disengagement, the unilateral disengagement of 2005, two years before Bush forces them to hold an election where Hamas wins a plurality which makes it three years before the failed coup of 2007, which led to Hamas taking over the entire Gaza Strip and then the uh, instituting of the siege. And then very quickly war broke out after that, you know, or if it, you know, rockets here and bombings there uh, on the regular mowing the grass campaigns and all that. So this interview comes one year before all that. And the guy is taking, it's the Jerusalem Post, and I just republished it on my website because they don't have it at the Jerusalem Post anymore, but they do have two different articles by the same author and interviewer where she refers to it and quotes from it. So it is legit, and you can find it republished elsewhere on the internet. And although I haven't been able, somebody can find for me the original link that I could put in the Wayback Machine or something like that, I would appreciate that. I would much prefer to have the original, original source. But I know uh, certainly even the most controversial quotes out of this are verified on the Jerusalem Post site in articles by the uh, author. And um, so anyway, the point being is this guy's taking credit for the disengagement strategy. And he's saying, of course, right. he's opposed to as some American liberal Zionists might support the two-state solution, let the Palestinians go, meaning East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. Let them have independence so that we can be rid of them, so that they can keep an 80-20 super-duper Jewish majority in Israel, and they won't have the contradiction of occupying these people forever like this. This would have been the Ben-Gurion uh, uh, advice from the 67 war after the 67 war get out of there let these people go so we're not burdened with them right well this is a more cynical take on that this is a Likud party take on that which is hell no we don't want to give them a state we don't want to be fair to them but we do <laughs> want rid of them and even though they're not talking about pure transfer in here what they are talking about Gareth is essentially virtual transfer that by at the cost of pulling the Israeli Jewish settlers out of the Gaza Strip, yes, that's taking one on the chin because we like stealing that land, but anyway, at the cost of that, we get to sort of pretend that Gaza is not occupied territory anymore. So this right. 5 million Palestinians that we have prisoner, now it's only 3 million. So now you can mess with us about occupying 3 million in the West Bank, but at least it's not... And a 50 50 split or even a minority ruling a majority will have like somehow washed our hands of the people of Gaza because, after all, it's Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, that they really want. Gaza is sort of an afterthought. But the problem is, as Soffer says in this interview, there are just too many Palestinian babies being made right. and being born. And so, because of this demographic threat, we got to somehow kick them out of here. Again, even if only virtually. But then if we're not giving them a state, what does that mean? It means that they're going to be put in a cage. And then the interviewer says, yeah, but then what? And he says, well, under especially Hamas's leadership, Islamist leadership, they're going to go nuts. He says they're going to turn into animals and they're going to fight us. They're going <laughs> to shoot rockets at us. And then we will have only one choice, he says to kill and kill and kill. And they'll just have to learn that whenever they resist, that essentially they are beaten. And whenever they resist, if they shoot one rocket at us, we're going to kill the whole family and everybody on the block of the guy who shot the rocket. And at some point, they'll just give up, he says. And then he says, the only worry is 
the poor Israeli soldiers who have to do all the killing and their broken heart, you know, just as which is straight out of the Gestapo propaganda, right? Our poor heroes who have to uh, do the dirty deed of machine gunning the villagers in the town square, you know. Um, so anyway, that's and this guy's like, yeah, I'm the architect of the disengagement strategy. That's the whole point of this. And and then but this is what it's led to. And Netanyahu is the inheritor of Sharon's strategy there and in the propping up Hamas to continually delegitimize the people of the Gaza Strip so that they don't have to deal with them. Now it's come to the point where they're clearly, I guess, would you say clearly? I, I mean, it seems like the only counterpoint is their propaganda with their claim but every half of what they claim and everything they do sure does seem to be indicating that hell or high water they are not going to let these people come back blinken can blather on about a two-state solution they just said that today no two-state solution we don't care what you say we're not right. doing that we will control the gaza strip and then it seems like they mean to without the Palestinian people ever being allowed to come back under the control of anybody. They have to go somewhere. If not the Congo, then at least the Sinai Peninsula or somewhere. Or how convinced are you that that is definitely the strategy? Or do you think that the Americans, even if so, if, if you're certain that that's certainly their strategy, do you think that Biden and Blinken want to turn that around and will turn that around? Because they do seem to be saying things about how they don't approve of a full replacement yeah, campaign here two two very different questions i mean on the first question i do think that the israelis have reached a point where um their their solution is a combination of this genocide genocidal uh, approach uh, militarily and this this rather stupid uh, and and i think a non-starter that that says yeah we'll, we'll help arrange to for them to go to other countries where they'll be happier right um and so you know and what percentage of the population they anticipate being able to to do that with is a, is an open question but um on the american side look i mean the, the, this uh, this approaching election is going to have something to say about uh, what what the Biden administration's policy, uh, how how that sort of evolves in the coming months, because uh, it's it's very it's a very serious political problem for Biden, in terms of his Democratic Party base, um, and that you you saw, you know the the election night, uh, not the election night, the the. Uh, the night in, in Iowa where they were all uh, uh, casting their their uh, choices for uh, for the, the Republican nominee, uh, the the uh, very democratic uh, pro democratic uh, uh, spokespeople were talking very clearly about the need for Biden to do something to alleviate the problems that he's having with a part, very large parts of his base who do not like his policy toward Israel and Palestine at all, Israel and Gaza. Yeah, well, and it is such a split between the donor class and the voters in the party on this one, which is a really kind of fun experiment. I don't know if you remember, was it 08 or 12? where they had the convention out in L.A., and they had a resolution, which was a pro-Israel resolution, and the nays had it by 300% or something. You know, they go, can we get the yays? And they were like, yay. Yeah. And then they, can we get the nays? And it was like in a basketball stadium or something in L.A., I forget <laughs> exactly. And the place just boomed with bass under all yeah. the hell no's. And yeah, then yeah. the chair was the mayor of L.A. at the time, and he goes, yeah, the eyes have it. And everybody yeah, was right. like, I, what? I and the that. whole place went up that. in a roar. And they still were like, what are you going to do, man? I think somebody even walked up and whispered in the guy's ear that, like, you better say yes. <laughs> so, and, and we could see we could see a, a repeat of that uh, at the Democratic convention. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it may be much worse, but there's a real crack up coming. And by the way, too. 
there's a crack up on the right about this, too. There are a lot of conservatives who feel very burned for very good reasons after supporting George W. Bush's terror wars. And who want no part of this. And when people say America first, they understand what that means. That doesn't mean be a selfish jerk. That means defend America first. Leave the world to hell alone is what that means. And... They believe that and they take that seriously. That's not just some stupid like campaign slogan next to MAGA or something. They really mean it. And then all of a sudden they're supposed to forget all that when it comes to Ukraine. All of a sudden they're supposed to forget all that when it comes to Israel and Palestine. And especially when they're burying women and children alive like this in front of everybody in this most horrific fashion. Why in the world are they supposed to forget what they believed yesterday? And how are they yeah. supposed to... Yeah get over being commanded that they have to it, it just doesn't seem right does it doesn't feel right and there's a whole bunch of people new leaders on the right who are not going for it gareth hmm. in fact well the polls consistently say half of republicans want a ceasefire and that's going on more than a month now maybe six weeks now half of republicans there was even a poll that said 56 percent. i don't know but there's quite a few consistently say half of Republicans want a permanent ceasefire right now. Not kill them all and let Allah sort them out. Not let Dick Cheney right. go in there and murder them all with a chainsaw. But stop this right now. Half of Republican voters, according to the polls. Well, I think this uh, this situation is only going to get more uh, tight for uh, for Biden in the coming months. I mean, I think that he is going to be under such terrific pressure that it, it very well could make a difference uh, in the coming weeks. I, yeah. You know, that's my hope. Certainly. Which is you, you extrapolate from there too. that's just going to make Trump 10 times worse on it than he already is. Right. Because then he's going to be like, oh, the liberals, they hate Israel so much, but I'm Netanyahu's <laughs> man, blah, blah, blah. I suppose, I suppose, yeah, he might try to pull that. I don't know how he's, he's for sure. He has a very pro Likud record to brag about, recognizing the seizure of Golan yeah. and moving yeah. the embassy right. and the all the <laughs> bogus Abraham Accords that led right to October 7th that he's committed to. I mean, this is the Netanyahu Trump doctrine. Oh, we'll give them the deal of the century and they can just accept permanent occupation and dispossession. Yeah. And and he may not have people whispering in his ear, hey, this is not such a great idea politically for you. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. You know, and this is the same with civil liberties issues. It's the same with foreign policy all over the place, not just in Israel-Palestine, but the left half of America and the right half of America are each about half good on things a lot of the time. But unfortunately, the leaders are all agreed on what's horrible. And so the people yeah. are kind of left out in the cold where the people overall, the right and left, well they said. would prefer to keep well the Bill said, of Rights, yeah. for example, you know? Well said, well said. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for doing the show. You're episode 6,000 and uh, just like you're episode 5,000 and you're my very favorite. I've interviewed you, I don't know how many hundred times, 300 and something times now. And everybody go check the archives at scotthorton.org slash archives and listen to all of my Gareth Porter interviews. They're so great because he's so great. You're so great. Thank you. Thank my good you friend, so much, for doing Scott. The show. I, would be, I would be more uh, florid about it, but I know you have to go. Yeah. No, nah, it's cool. Love you, man. Appreciate Thanks. you. Talk to you soon. Bye. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.